Amen, and amen, and amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you, our King of Kings. Thank you, our great and awesome God. There is none that is like you. We have gathered in your name tonight, and we ask that your glory will reign upon your children. Have your way, mighty Jesus. Have your way, King of glory. In the name of Jesus, we decree that it is well with us tonight and that no weapon formed against us shall stand. I pray that the Lord shall be on the throne and that every word that would be spoken tonight would come from his very lips in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We hand over to you, your son, the instrument you are going to use tonight. Father, lay your hands upon him. Uh, bless every word from his mouth. Do not permit that any word of his will fall on the ground. But let them bear fruit according to your own ordinance, O Lord, in the name of Jesus. And we hold captive every unclean spirit in the name of Jesus. Everywhere, in every form or manner or shape that the enemy may want to raise their ugly head or heads, Against this message, we are commanding their heads to be smashed in the name of Jesus. And we minister the blood of Jesus over the air, over the atmosphere, over the ground of this prayer. And we decree that nothing of darkness will have any share in this very fellowship in the name of Jesus. And Father, may your light therefore begin to shine over everywhere in the name of Jesus. Let your glory reign tonight in Jesus' mighty name. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen and amen. Friends in Christ, it is my pleasure today to welcome each and every one of us to the hearts of Jesus and Mary Ministries. And today we are going to take a quick reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 28, verse 8 to 15. I repeat, Matthew, chapter number 28, verse 8 to 15. And the, the Bible translation we shall be reading from is the New Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. Thank you, Jesus. So, they left the tomb quickly with fear and with great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, you must say, his disciples came by night. And they stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governors, their ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story is still told among the Jews to this day. And this 
is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus. My dear friends, the reading we have just had is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. And this is the story, or part of the story, of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is taken from Matthew's perspective, what, what he knew about the, the resurrection of Jesus. And from this reading, we see a very interesting opening remark taken from or referencing Matthew 28, verse 8. The Bible says there, so they left the tomb quickly with the fear and the great joy and they ran to tell his disciples. Take note that when Jesus resurrected, it was not all the disciples that saw him. We might understand that the, at the first day of the week, while it was still dawning, Mary Magdalene and the, the other Mary went to see the tomb. This was happening very early in the morning on the first day. And the Bible tells us how there was suddenly a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like the lightning and his clothing white as snow. Amen. Now, there were some soldiers who were there at the tomb, who had the mandate, the assignment to make sure that nobody comes to carry Jesus away, that the disciple does not come to carry Jesus away. They just made everything, made plans according to human wisdom to make sure that nobody interrupts with their plan. But heaven came to interrupt their plans. And when this angel came, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 4, that great fear came upon these gods. You see that? They were stone dead, became like a dead man, as the scripture will say. But we learn also that the angels, the angel rather, said to the woman, do not be afraid. The angel wasn't speaking to the gods, but was speaking to the women who are afraid. Now, my dear friends in Christ, there, the angel told them, I know who you are looking for. You are looking for Jesus who was crucified. They hadn't told the angel while they were there. But the angel was there telling them why, why they were there. And told them, look, the one you are looking for is not here. Referring to Jesus, of course. For he had risen. You see that? So 
So, in this episode, my dear friends of Christ, when I understand who are the dead in verse 8 of Matthew 28 that the scripture is talking about. Talking about these women that came to the tomb of Jesus the first day of the week on the Easter day. This woman, after encountering this angel and then getting the message they got, they left the tomb quickly with fear and with great joy. I repeat, with fear and with great joy. Fear is an emotion. And they had great fear. Joy is also an emotion. And they had great joy. These two emotions were playing in the lives of these two women at the same time. They left the tomb after having an encounter with the angel, left there with fear and with joy, great joy. Do you see that? <laughs> I ran to tell the other disciples. Then suddenly John Jesus now came to them and said, Greetings. And they came to him. Took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Because he saw that they were afraid. If they were not afraid, he would not have told them, do not be afraid. Then he now tells them, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, that they were to see me. My dear friends in Christ, the mission of these women to go and tell the disciples of Jesus their experience at the tomb that is evangelism to announce a message that brings glory to Jesus to announce the good news of the resurrection to tell the story of the encounter with Jesus but that evangelism, that mission was a mixture of joy and fear. A mixture of joy and fear. Some translations of the Bible will say that they left the tomb half overjoyed and they half fearful. Is that a familiar? <laughs> this divided reaction among these women still occurs today. When we first encounter Jesus, when we first encounter the risen Lord, when we first give our lives to Jesus, we receive that with great joy. Is it not true? We receive that with great joy. We rejoice with, with our brethren for that opportunity to give our life to Christ. To receive Christ. But we also realize that quickly quickly that we begin to receive some oppositions. Challenges begin to rise. Responsibilities begin to rise. 
And before you know what's happening, that drive, that passion to evangelize, to tell people about Jesus begins to fade away. The fear, I mean, the, the, the fire is no more as it used to be. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You have forsaken. You have abandoned the fire, the drive you had before. You had before when you gave your life to Christ. When you first received Christ, you were preaching, you were evangelizing. Perhaps you were doing morning cry. Morning cry, that's a, a type of evangelism where you get up early in the morning, very early, while people are still sleeping. You get up and be preaching. Preaching the gospel. So when people are uh, waking up very early in the morning, maybe around 4.45, 5 a.m., they are hearing uh, somebody's voice like a, a voice in the desert. And while on the bed, they are listening to that preaching. It is only for love of Christ that one would wake up and do that. We give our life to Christ and we change the way we talk. Maybe we have been speaking some profane words. We do not do them again. Maybe there were places we used to go, we do not go to those places again. Places that would not bring glory to God. There were some companies we used to be with, but now we will not be in those companies again because we have given our lives to Christ. And uh, most of our friends become enemies because they think that something is wrong with us. They think we are, we are taking this in too far. We had no room for compromise. Every time we go to read the Bible, reflect on it. We spend time reading the Bible. And we have that fulfillment of always being with the Lord in prayer, in the Word, in going to the Blessed Sacrament, in praying the Rosary, in the Mass, in the Eucharist. It's all about coming closer and closer to Jesus. For such, we would Understand the the words of of the psalmist where he said, "The moment I hear, let us go to the house of the Lord." I was filled with joy. That's the passion I'm talking about. That's the passion you see in Peter that made him tell Jesus, "Look, <laughs> I don't know this you're talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to leave you." Whatever place you go, I'll go with you. Jesus told him, look, you don't know what I'm talking about. But before the cock the cross, cross, you have denied me three times. But Peter was talking as a man with fire, love for God. And now, eventually, that prophecy came to pass, and he saw that he had denied Jesus, and that the prophecy of Jesus had come to pass because he had a cock growing, then Peter began to weep. Weeping because he had, he realized he had offended God, his master. That is love. 
That is love. Even when the disciples of Jesus were scampered away because of the what was going on in Jerusalem, Jesus was already arrested and uh, killed. Passion was everywhere. But they were still coming together in the upper room for the breaking of the bread, to fellowship together because of the love for Christ. The love for Christ. Now in the Acts of Apostles, we see what this love for Christ had done. Not only in their lives, but the lives of those who came among them. But on a single day, 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ. Where these men, who used to be full of fear, were now bold to evangelize. Knowing fully that Jesus had told them, carry this message, carry my word, carry this gospel, this good news, to everywhere. They knew that the word of God was so important and that Jesus was all focusing his work on spreading the word. Passion. Passion. They were filled with the fear. But they were also filled with joy. But they did not allow the fear to weaken them, to arrest them, to tie them down. At the first, the fear was like a fire escalating. But because they come together in prayer, they were able to reconcile with the Lord. And they began to become fire-branded men and women of God. My dear friends of Christ, let this mean to us today uh, an opportunity to evaluate our, our stand. Are we growing spiritually? Are we growing in our faith? Are we bearing fruit in our faith? That first love we had when we gave our lives to Christ, do we still have it? Is a fire heating up? Is the water boiling? Are we at boiling temperature spiritually? Or are we freezing? Are we freezing? Are we frozen by fear? Where do we place our love for Christ at this point in time? Jesus is talking to us. In fact, in Luke 12, verse 49... Jesus says, look, I have come to this earth to bring fire, to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. How I wish it were already blazing. Luke 12, 49. The Lord has given us so much he has given us a share in his kingdom. But an assignment and responsibility also. Evangelism is something that is very critical in our time. In fact, most critical. It has always been critical. But now that the coming of the Son of Man is closest, evangelism is even more critical than ever. Because we are in injury time. 
in the injury time, people don't sleep. One thing that is common with injury time is that during that time, passion is high. Passion. You don't sleep when you are in the injury time. You don't sleep. If you are sleeping during the injury time, you are a good disciple of Jesus. When the field is ripe and it is the harvest time, why would the, fire, the farmer be sleeping that time? This is the harvest time. Where do you classify yourself? Your passion for the Lord. Are you ascending spiritually? Or are you going down? Because if you think you are stagnant, you are wrong. Because in the spiritual realm, is that you are ascending or you are descending? There's nothing like sitting on the fence. Nothing like that. The Lord wants us not to allow fear of what people will say or what people will do to quench the fire in us. So many things are happening in the world today. And it's all about coming against the spreading of this word of God. This very thing that is so important to Jesus. That before he ascends to heaven, he told the disciples, make sure you carry this gospel to everywhere. Even to the end of the earth. When Jesus told them this, they went into everywhere, Samaria, Judea everywhere preaching. They faced so many persecutions, thrown to prison, faced hunger, faced rejections, that the fire in them was stronger. So they even found it joyful, all joy, that they were facing those troubles. They counted it all joy. But how about you and I? We do not face persecution the way they face persecution for them, prison for them. Of course, many of them were beheaded. That was very hostile. That's not the kind of persecution we face. The persecution we face might just be, you know, somebody just looking at you and saying, well, I don't think you're my friend again. And we want to please such a person. I'll begin to compromise. None of us has been brought to a red martyrdom. That martyrdom where blood is sparing. That's not what we suffer. Yet, we are cold. Jesus says no. What has happened to your first love? What has happened? God talking to all of us, including myself. Satan couldn't prevent resurrection. If he could prevent it, he would have. But he couldn't. He couldn't stop Jesus from rising from the dead. So what will Satan do? Now he couldn't stop Jesus from resurrecting. What, what could he do? Well, he wants to Spread lies, doubts, things that will make people believe that this may be a scam. 
uh, Jesus did not rise. The people were just formulating this story. <laughs> and you see, you see the biblical account of this whole thing. How, even when it was obvious to the guards who were soldiers, who saw the angel that opened the, the that rolled back the stone, and. Uh, they could not stand the glory of that angel. Before their eyes, Jesus resurrected. And they went and told the government, the rulers of the time, what they saw. That this man that we, we crucified and buried, look, look at what look at what happened. Look at the angel came and he resurrected. Should have been the evangelist telling the world that Jesus resurrected. They see what the devil did. He stifled that evangelism. He stifled their testimony. He made them become agents of false news, agents of lies, and they were paid to disprove resurrection. Yes, it's true that the body of Jesus is no more there. Uh, tell the story that the disciples came and carried him away. And they were paid a large lump of money to spread that news. And that was the one that the world believed. That was what the Bible tells us. That that's the news that is being believed even among the Jews. <laughs> the Bible says, Matthew 28, verse 15. And this story is still told among the Jews till today. That was the Bible says, Matthew 28, verse 15. They, they were bribed to preach a lies. Who was responsible? The devil. He couldn't stop Jesus from resurrecting. But even to those who experienced his resurrection, he made sure they became instruments to carry bad news, to carry anti-resurrection news. And there were many of them and people who listen to them and they use the government quarters the the platform of the government the instruments of the government to propagate the news government had resources on how to spread news to the people when the governor was t telling the news or when the media was talking telling the new news of how the disciples of jesus came and stole him away People will believe them. In our time, we will say that they have, they have the media. In their time, they also have their own type of media. Though not technological type as we have today, but they have a way that they spread news. And it was all in the hand of the government. So they used their resources to spread this news that is false, lie against the church, against the body of Christ, against heaven, against the Son of Man, against Jesus. It still happens today. Let a miracle be done. Even in a church, while intense prayer is going on, and somebody begins to work, the world will surely see something to say. Oh, how are you sure it's blind? This is a stage. This is a scam. Unfortunately, 
this same devil who have been working against the church has also sent his own agents who also have their own church who also are men of God, not capital G, who have access to the pulpit and who do miracles and who do fake miracles and uh, people who have staged these false miracles, sometimes they repent and say, oh, you know, I was paid to say this, I was paid to, to act like a, somebody healed of blindness. And so, when we stage, when such things are staged, you see the implication, the world will use it against the church. The world will use it against the body of Christ. They will say, hey, this is how they behave. Once it comes from the church, it will be an attack. But we know there are still true miracles that Jesus does. True miracles. That the devil has the fight in the church and the staging fake miracles does not mean that miracles don't take place. In fact, the fact that there are fake miracles tells you that there are true miracles. If the devil does not know that true miracles exist, he wouldn't bother himself going to do fake miracles. But he does that fake miracles because he knows that there is original. What gives credit to counterfeit is original. If if original does not exist, then counterfeit has no basis to even exist. But because the original exists, the original currency exists, then it gives room <laughs> for the counterfeit. The devil is, devil is taking advantage of the original he cannot arrest the original. He cannot change it. He cannot change the truth. But he can make his counterfeit. The counterfeit of truth is falsehood, is lie. And that is the expertise of the devil. Don't forget that the Bible says that he is the father of lies. Jesus is the father of truth. For he is the truth himself. Jesus is truth himself. I am the truth, John fourteen six. So lie exists because truth exists. So let us understand that whatever thing the devil does, it is just to counterfeit what Jesus does. Jesus has his prophets. The devil has his own prophets. Jesus has his own teachers. The devil has his own teachers. Jesus has his own churches. Church. The devil has his own churches. And so on and so forth. Now, Jesus has risen. What a, a splendid testimony, news that is supposed to shake everywhere. Yet, the devil had his own counterfeit. Bribe people to carry on with another type of evangelism that is going against the true evangelism. The devil is spreading his lies. Demonic evangelism. But you and I, if we are sleeping, it means we are giving room, comfortable atmosphere, giving Lego ground for the devil to spread his lies. We have to rise. We have to rise up to preach this good news. The season we are right now is not just a season of Easter, but also a season of evangelism. Because if you read it, if you read the Acts of Apostles, you read the reading of the, go through the reading of the church, pay attention, you will see that in this season, it is all about evangelism. The church is inviting us to evangelize. 
It's about spreading the good news. It started since Easter. We are called to evangelize, to spread the good news of the risen Lord. If we don't do it, we do it. Devil, of course, you know, he cannot do that. He would rather spread the counter news, the lies, the counterfeited one, the fake one, the fake news. That's what we do. News that is, is, is falsehood. That's what you spread. And we know that his own spreads like what fire. The truth takes time. But at the end, it will. It will rain. It will be exalted. Truth is never in a hurry. Good news is not in a hurry. What is in a hurry is bad news. That's why they fly like like a, a wildfire. But truth is patient. But when it emerges, it is a light. Great light. That will scatter the blanket of darkness, the, the rain of darkness. So Jesus is looking into our eyes and saying, are you going to evangelize for me? Are you going to make yourself available for me? That's what Jesus is talking about. Oh, Jesus, I'm afraid of evangelism. Well, even the woman who had the encounter of the of heaven of the angel of the lord they were also afraid they were also afraid and jesus told them fear not i am with you now go and tell my brothers and what did they do they now went with joy mixture of fear and joy was playing but they anchored on Jesus. I like the way Peter said it when he saw Jesus walking on the sea. He said, Lord, if it is you, call me to come. And he came. That is... That's faith, right? Now he begins to walk on the water. That is faith. But at the time, Peter began to sink. Why? Because he look, began to look at the storm, and fear came. Fear was what was causing him to think. But we also know that even in that mixture of fear, there was some faith in Peter that he was not drowning out of sight. But when he was gradually drowning because his fear factor was increasing, and then he now cried out for help, Jesus Help me. If you think you are sinking into the sea of fear that wants to paralyze you from bearing fruit for Jesus, from evangelizing, cry out and say, Jesus, help me. Put your word into me. He only promised us that when we stand for him, he will not allow us to be Empty of words. His spirit will remind us what to say. His spirit will speak through us. All that he wants from us is to be available. Make ourselves available. Jesus is sending this to us this night. There's no more time. We're in injury time. We're in injury time. Jesus has been saying, I will come soon. He has been saying this even before we are born. Our forefathers he saw, heard it. We are still hearing it. And one thing I tell you, many say, oh, if it's time I'm coming, I'm coming, where are you going to come? Well, let me tell you. You see, in, the, in Christ's time scale, it's different from our own human time scale. A, a thousand years in this world is like a moment in the eyes of God, in his own calendar. And the moment can be like a thousand years. 
So when he says, I'm coming soon, if you look at it from a human point of view, soon, soon suggests to us something that's going to happen very quickly, not too far from now. But in his own timing, his own timing, a moment is like a thousand years. This is a God who lives in eternity. When we live with Jesus in heaven, we live forever. That is, if you look at the time we have spent on earth, compare that with eternity, you find that it is just like a drop of water in an ocean. If I ask you, what do you think is the age of the rock in the Garden of Eden that is found today? Science may tell us maybe some hundreds and thousands of years or millions of years, whichever is the case, it is still a drop of water compared with the ocean of eternity. So when we are talking of millions of years, Jesus is seeing it relative to eternity as a moment. As a moment. You see that? Even we ourselves, when we were small boys playing, playing uh, on the street, you look at your father, you think he was like... It will take you thousands of years to get to his age. You even wonder, who you still got your father as a very old man. But now, your own children are looking on to you. And to them, it looks like as if it is in eternity that they will become like you, become old like you. But if you look back now, if you look in retrospect, you see that it was like yesterday. You see, it was like yesterday. When we begin to come closer to reality, we see that the age we are today, if we look back, we see that the time we were in high school, the time we were uh, in our childhood, it was like yesterday. So if Jesus is saying, I'm coming soon, that is true. Because If, <laughs> okay, this is year 2023, okay, so over 2,000 years ago, he has said it, right? Fine. Somebody might say, oh, since you said this, it has not come to pass. But let me repeat myself again. That 2,000 years ago, it's just like yesterday. Relative to eternity. Eternity is time without end. Time without end. Can you imagine a time scale that reduces 100 million years to a drop in a time scale? That's what I'm talking about. Eternity. And I'm telling you that He's coming soon. He started saying, I will come soon. Some 2,000 years ago. Right? And I tell you, 2,000 years out of that time means we are closer to his coming. So it is even closer than soon. Sooner than soon. That is the more reason why we should live our lives as people who are conscious of spending eternity with Jesus. And one of the things such people would do is to live righteously, okay? 
obey his commandments, but also very importantly, is to evangelize. Because when we are evangelizing, we give opportunity for those who are not in light of Jesus to come into his light and become children of light and not children of darkness. But if we are afraid to go and evangelize, to go and talk to them, how can they believe that Jesus has risen? How can they believe that Jesus is Lord? How can they believe that Jesus is coming again? What is even most disturbing is that, let me tell you, the devil is really, his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, they are walking, they, are, they don't sleep. You and I will sleep after this prayer meeting, we sleep. In the kingdom of the devil, they do not sleep. They are called the kingdom of darkness, meaning that even the night, they are at work. That is their own day. Don't sleep. Walking. Mapping out strategies to destroy souls. And the devil knows that, it's, that he has no much time. So he has heightened the, the, the affliction against the saints. He has heightened it. But for the saints, let them evangelize boldly. There is this sense of joy that one experiences when one goes to evangelize, when one talks to some other person about Jesus. You may not be accepted. It may not end quite well. They may not even listen to you. But once you do it, there's a joy that you cannot even explain. Joy of joys. Very deep. So by this message, we encourage to go and evangelize. Talk to someone about Jesus. That is the season we are now. The season we are now, season to talk to someone about Jesus. Somebody can stop you on the road and say, oh, sister, I like, the, I, like, I like the cloth you are wearing. And you, you probably tell the person, oh, yeah, thank you so much. I, I bought it in some, in some place. Uh, uh, and you begin to even advertise the cloth. Cloth of manufactured by or made by a teller or a company you don't even know. You advertise even the marketer, oh, I bought it on Amazon. I, I bought it at this cost, but you can get it cheaper at another place. Uh, you... you you see how you take time to even make that person to buy something that you're not even going to gain anything from. How about doing it for Jesus? How about doing it for Jesus? How about making time to talk to someone about Jesus that way? Thank God we're not living in a time when one could be beheaded. I mean, not all of us are living in a country where somebody will be beheaded for preaching the gospel. Jesus is talking to us. Remember the theme of this message. Afraid, yet joyful. Afraid, yet joyful. Matthew 28, verse 8. That though these women were afraid, they have fear, yet they have great joy. That is part of the mixture of these emotions. They were preaching. They were going to tell other disciples. Read Matthew 20, verse 8. You see that they were going to evangelize in spite of the fear that is mixed with the joy. 
They ran to tell his disciples, the disciples of Jesus. So with fear and joy. Ran to tell, ran to tell, ran to tell, that's evangelism. To tell the disciples. <laughs> the Lord is talking to us, my dear friends. If we cannot talk to somebody about Jesus, it means we are not grateful human beings. If we cannot boldly eh, tell somebody about Jesus, every time, every day you come to the ministry, you listen to the preaching. Over years, do you know how much you have accumulated? Eh? The, the content of the Word of God we have been able to listen to. Is it not proper that at least you make a little time? I said, let me talk to this person about Jesus. Let me invite this person to the, to the prayer line. Let me talk to this person about Jesus. You may think that person will not listen to you. You don't know how the Holy Spirit does things. As you open your eyes or your mouth to speak, the person, Holy Spirit can arrest that person. I use you to save the life of that person. And Jesus will be so happy with you. You may be afraid when you are you intending to tell the person the thing. But there is joy. There is joy that you are doing the will of God. There is joy. <laughs> Jesus. So let us understand that if we are not evangelizing, we are giving the enemy the opportunity to spread their anti-evangelism, to spread their darkness. If the children of the kingdom of darkness have such a passion, and I tell you the truth, they have more passion than us. They have it. <laughs> the kingdom of darkness, they have rules, and they obey the rules. All these people in our court kingdom, I tell you, they obey the rules. I remember one day when somebody who uh, who, who was in occult and brought his uh, occult books uh, to me to he wants to come out of occultism it took him a long time to make that decision the wife was multi pressure multi pressure multi pressure And the man was afraid that if he surrenders the occult book, he was going to die. It's good to have a godly wife. So I said, no. Go and meet brother. So eventually, he now made up his mind. And I had a talk with him. I led him to Christ, prayed over him, took the book, prayed over the book, Cast out the spirit that is the book. And he's allowed to today, nothing happened to him. He may be in this prayer meeting, listening to this preaching. He's not in Christ. He has given so many testimonies to this prayer line. You see that? How can they know the truth unless you and I go and preach to them? But we are afraid of what they will do. We are afraid of what people will say. <laughs> if we are afraid of what we will say, let me tell you, it means that we are we are under attack when that is happening. Anything that makes us not evangelize is an attack from the kingdom of the darkness. Because it means that the devil who does not want the good news to spread is manipulating us 
not to spread the good news. Okay? Because he knows that when the good news is spread, souls are delivered. You see that? So one of the main ways Satan tries to limit the spread of good news is to tempt you and I to be afraid. Afraid of evangelism or evangelizing. Afraid of radical uh, Christian lifestyle. That, uh, what I mean by that is a lifestyle that does not blend with the ways of the world. Okay? He wants us to be afraid of stepping out in faith. He wants us to be afraid of rejection. So we are cowed down. <laughs> well, let me say, if Satan can take a hold of at least a part of us, <laughs> he's well on his way to reducing us from a half witness to no witness at all. So Jesus tells us to be his witnesses. Jesus tells us in Matthew 28 verse 10, do not be afraid. I am with you. Okay? Jesus confronted fear himself. He confronted fear by issuing a challenge. He sent his followers out to go and tell the good news. That was what he told the disciples. Go and tell the good news. Go and tell them. Go and tell them that I've risen. He challenged them. Action is the antidote of fear. And in the moment they began to put their faith into action, going to evangelize, telling people, look, I've seen the Lord, when they began to do that, fear dissipated. Fear took away. They went to the street and began to do it boldly. Even when they were put in prison, they were in prison, they were still preaching. They were still doing the same thing they were asked not to do. Persecution was increasing. Their boldness also increasing action. <laughs> Enough of all this, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Does that statement convert anybody? It is by living it. It is by sharing it that we convert, that it becomes active, that it becomes an agent to win souls. Not by saying, oh, I'm a Christian. And then, even the devil can say that. But that he says it does not mean that he is one. How many people say they are Christians but they are not Christians? A Christian is one who lives the life of Christ. <laughs> if we are half fearful like the women of... Uh, of uh, the day of resurrection, um, if we have fearful like them, let's turn to the better half, the half that is half overjoyed. You see, in that Luke 28, some translations will say they were half fearful, half overjoyed. So if one has a half fearfulness in him, it means that the person have half joyfulness in him. So why would have how why would they have fearfulness? Swallow the half of a joyfulness. No, no, no. No. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus and in the joy of his victorious resurrection. So in that way, his joy will be ours. And our evangelism will be his joy. Amen. 
and may your joy be complete in him. For only in Christ are we complete. Only in Christ. We start in him. We progress in him. And we are complete in him. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are risen. You have conquered sin. You have conquered death. You have conquered darkness. Conquer us. And use us to do your will. Use us to announce fearlessly the good news of you. The good news of risen life in you. Use us, Lord, to do this. Help us to be bold preachers, bold witnesses of yours. Do not allow timidity to weigh us down. Please are many more with prayer. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen. We cover ourselves, Lord of Jesus. And Lord, I will pray that even in our dreams, remind us to preach this good news. In everything we do, let this message be resonating in our hearts. So remind us to preach the good news. To preach, to evangelize. Give us that grace to evangelize. Help us, O oh Lord, to evangelize. May we never take evangelism for granted. These are many more we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. And the